You ready to go back? Honestly, no. You know, I say we just stay and hang out here for a little while. They won't be missing us yet anyway. Do you hear that? Hear what? Nothing. There's no kids screaming. Nobody arguing over how to cut the turkey. Nobody talking over each other. Aha, uh -huh, so that's why you're so anxious to volunteer to walk to the store with me. You got it. I just had to get out of there. You know, I love our family, and Mom did a great job on Thanksgiving this year, but... I know, sis. Sometimes family can really get on your nerves, especially over the holidays. You know, I didn't want to say that, but you're right. You know, just once, it would be nice to have a Thanksgiving dinner that's quiet, a place that's peaceful, a place that's calm, and a place where you can have all the white meat that you wanted. <laughs> Some place with no kids screaming and you didn't have to fix their plates first. A place where nobody bothered you. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hello. Happy Thanksgiving. I am Cecil Miss Penelope, and we live here in the big fat park. Hello. Oh. Uh, look, Penelope, they are bag people just like we are. <laughs> Oh, hey, they're giving away Thanksgiving dinners down at the Mission. Yeah. You should go get some. They got, they got turkey and they got dressing. They got red stuff and then they got smashed potatoes. Sm but they didn't have any pumpkin pie. No. Can you believe it? No pumpkin pie. Oh, but we're thankful anyway, right, Cecil? Yes, pumpkin pie is no big deal. No. But you better hurry and get to the mission before they run out. Oh, thank you, but we've already had our Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, we just ran out of a few things and went to the store. Oh, oh you're so lucky. You had a real live Thanksgiving dinner. Yes. A real live one. You're <laughs> so lucky. You're very lucky. Hey, listen, why don't we leave you two oh, alone so oh, you guys no. can... You don't have, have to go because... Oh, yeah. You could stay. You can stay because Penelope and I don't. We don't eat our Thanksgiving dinner till after we do our Thanksgiving transitions. <laughs> no, Cecil, it's tradition. It's with a duh. Tradition. Duh. Is that even? I don't know. It's not even a word. Tradition. It's a, a tradition. <laughs> hey. What is your tradition? Oh. I'll show you. It's in my bag here. Hurry. I'm here. You can save that one. It's, I like that one. It's our Thanksgiving box. Penelope and I, we write down all the things we're thankful for, and we put them in the big fat box. Yeah. Well, I write them down because Cecil can't write. Well, can you show us how does your Thanksgiving box work? Okay. I'll go first. Okay. Oh. You get one for me. Okay. Well, Cecil can't read either. <laughs> it says our home oh, our home home it's our home i am thankful for a beautiful place we have to live in it's here i am thankful for god giving us such a beautiful park to live in yeah. and today i'm going to find the man who takes care of the big fat park and i'm going to thank him oh it's a big fat park <laughs> i i'll go next it says close oh, yeah close <clears throat> I am thankful for the clothes that we get at the mission. I will find old Charlotte, I like Charlotte. and thank her for always, always giving us our beautiful clothes. I know. <laughs> Charlotte. Why don't you try one? Uh, okay, hey, yeah. Doreen, why don't you pick one for the both of us? Start the Thanksgiving okay. box. Just get one. Just one now. Family. family. It says family. Family? You're kidding. <gasps> but you do have families. We do. Yeah, like like moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas. Yes. yes. Moms and dads. You're very lucky. You're so lucky. So now you go home and you tell your families <laughs> that you're thankful for them. Yep. Oh, but I'm sure our family knows exactly how we feel about them. Huh? Mm -hmm. Our families know how much we appreciate them. No, no. you gotta say it. You gotta say they it. Need to they need it. to hear it. They need to hear it. They gotta you. hear it from you. So, Mister? Yeah. Do you have a wife? Yes. Do you have any, do you have any kids? Two. Two. Well, two. Well, have you told your wife and kids how two. thankful you are for them today? No. 
And, and lady, you must have a mommy and a daddy. Have you told them how thankful you are for them on this beautiful Thanksgiving day? Mm. Isn't just being with them today enough? No. no. You have to tell them because you might turn around one day and they might be gone. Yeah, you have to you say You have to it. tell them. I don't think we know how to tell them. Well, me and Cecil, we will show you how. Okay. <clears throat> My dearest Cecil, <laughs> have I told you lately how thankful I am for you? <laughs> well, I am thankful for all of you. <laughs> from the top of your shiny head and shiny. all the way down to your putty feet big fat feet well I am thankful for all of you <laughs> and you you are the best part of my life <laughs> you make me laugh and you make me sing and I thank God every day that he gave you to me <laughs> Thank you, my dearest Cecil. My dearest Penelope, even if you weren't so beautiful, I would still be thankful for you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're the only one who has ever really cared for me. And you take care of me all the time. And you don't make fun of me. And you, and you don't laugh at me. And you, you help me get through life. And... I thank you for that. So on this special Thanksgiving day, I hope you remember how special you are to me. Oh. The end. The end. Oh. You know, Doreen, I think we need to get back. I don't know about you, but I know I've got some people that I need to thank. I, I think we both have a lot of people we need to thank. Remember, you have to tell them. They need to, they hear, need to hear it. it. You know, Cecil, Penelope, thanks for showing us how to tell the people we love, uh, how much we appreciate them. No uh, problem. Happy well. Thanksgiving. Happy, Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Oh, <laughs> Goodbye. Uh -oh. I thought they were married when we first came in here. <gasps> here. <gasps> A pumpkin pie. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy, Happy, Thanksgiving. Happy, Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Thank you. Oh, isn't it beautiful? It's the pumpkin pie. Oh. Hmm. Cecil, what if one day you turn around and something's happened to me and I'm gone? What would you do? Well, at first I would be very sad, but then I'd be happy because you'd be in heaven with God living in a big fat house. Oh. <laughs> Big fat house. You're so silly. Mm -hmm. Cecil, I am so thankful for you. I'm so thankful for you, Penelope. Happy, Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. You want to buy? No. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Wonderful job. In worship and in drama. And Faith, in your song, appreciate you ministering to us in worship. Well, we've all been watching the news, and 50 years ago this week, we all remember what has taken place with our president, um, shot in, um, in downtown Dallas. And as we watched that, we watched everything that has taken place, and all the conspiracy issues, and you start wondering what in the world is taking place. But there's something that took place an hour earlier than when JFK was shot and murdered. It was the death of probably one of the greatest authors in the Christian realm that we've ever had. A man that has written more books, and more books have been written about him in the last 50 years, that has impacted us in a great and mighty way. The Christian influence that we have today is based upon not necessarily books about him, but books that he wrote, and that author was C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis died an hour before JFK was assassinated. 
And in his books, as we know now, the Chronicles of Narnia is one of his books that impacted us and it gave us a, a, a glimpse into a picture of an animated film talking about Jesus and the sacrifice that he has made. When you look at books, books can either be something that can open our eyes to the impossibilities or it can narrow our hearts and our minds because of infatuation. Sometimes we like to read books about books about books and we like to read books about the Bible but we don't want to read the Bible but we sure would like to read a book about the Bible. Or sometimes in our imaginations we like to read. And there are a few very popular books that, uh, that we get into a little bit. Let's look at the book or the trilogy called, oh, The Twilight. How many of you have watched or read the book, The Twilight Series? Raise your hands. Don't be shy. I'm not going to ask you on the next one. I'm just going to let you do this on The Twilight Series. Do you know, in the book and the movie series, The Twilight, it has recorded a net profit of five billion seven hundred and sixty million dollars since its inception that's a lot of stinking money that's a lot of money but let's look at maybe the books or the movie Harry Potter how many of you guys all of our kids have watched a little bit of Harry Potter I've watched some of the movies Harry Potter and my boys have read the books Harry Potter is the number one best-selling book of all times Harry Potter now it's not necessarily a Christian book is it it's a book that we can get into an imagination state and we can talk about wizardry and we can talk about the dark side. We can talk about good witches or bad witches. But sometimes we get into a fascination stage and we enjoy reading about something just so we can get caught up in a fairy tale world. Harry Potter. How about the Hunger Games? How many of you guys have read the book or watched the movies of the Hunger Games? Awesome, isn't it? Exciting what's taking place in there. But it is not necessarily a Christian perspective. But it is a way to transfer where you are into a wonderland and to start cheering for a, a series or cheering for a woman or cheering for a man. But there's a book out right now that's called Fifty Shades of Grey. I'm not going to ask how many ladies or men have read the book Fifty Shades of Grey, but Fifty Shades of Grey, in one day of its opening day, it sold 250,000 copies in the first day uh, it was out on um, Amazon. And Amazon records it is the fastest growing iBook book on record because a lot of people don't want to read Fifty Shades of Grey out by the pool. They want to look at it when nobody knows that they're reading it. And they call it now, I don't know if you ladies have known this or maybe some of you guys, it's called Mama, what? Mama porn. It gets into your imagination of watching and thinking about something that could take place in a magical world or what could take place in a home. And it transfers our hearts into our imaginations to start thinking about things that would not be what would be normal but it is a fantasy. Fifty Shades of Grey, the Fifty Shades trilogy, will say this. This is what the book report says. It will obsess you, possess you, and stay with you forever. It will obsess you, possess you, and it will stay with you forever. There's a lot of reasons why that book would stay with you forever. But let me tell you about what being a fan, whether it is a fan of sports, a fan of movies, or even a fan of books. What it does, it transfers your heart, your mind, and your thought life away from a reality, transports it to a place where you can live in a fantasy and not deal with reality. And there's not a book alive other than the Word of God that can transform your life. It can entertain you, but it will not transform you. So what I want to do is I want to try to share with you how can we have a transformed life. These books that we read could be entertaining. They could be fun. They could be uh, uh, something that we could just go into an oblivion, go into a, to a time, time uh, warp that you can just deal with things. But there's nothing about any one of these books that will do something for you to transform your life other than what we're going to talk about today. As a youth pastor for so long, when I would ask questions about uh, one of the biggest issues spiritually that we have, and two top answers came up 
every time I was asking our teenagers and our young adults what two spiritual issues they have that's holding them back from becoming the person they need to be. The first time is their prayer life. And I would agree with that on every one of us that we need to be able to pray more. We need to be able to get the heart of God and understand what God wants us to do. So the first issue that every one of our teenagers or young adults would say is, I need to learn how to pray more. And would you agree with that? We all need to learn how to pray more. We all need to see what God can do. But you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a little, a little stop here. But let me tell you, when you start praying more is when you see Todd stand up for a second. Stand up. Todd's little baby, Kelsey, was in Chicago this week and had heart surgery. And God, we've been praying for that little baby. And God touched that little baby and the baby came through surgery the next morning or the next evening and had some issues. But, but we were praying for that baby and now that baby is home, safe, sound and well because of prayer okay so now you, you can be seen but now you know what todd believes in now he believes in prayer because he single-handedly experienced prayer so when you see what god does in prayer it is easier for us to pray but sometimes when we go through life and we absorb our minds and other things that we never communicate to god we just get so used to life that we don't get a heart of god and we don't pray to god the second thing, other than prayer, is people really just don't read and apply the Word of God. We learn applications of Scripture, but we don't gaze on the Scripture and say, what does the Scripture really mean? We'll sit and we'll digest trilogies. We'll read five or six books about a certain topic. And you can say, whether you like Edwin or, or whoever the other guy, Jacob, or, or whether whoever you like, and you can know all about the different characters of all kinds of different books. And you can tell what they're doing, when they're doing, what's taking place. And you can have conversation after conversation of a trilogy of a book that makes absolutely no difference within our life. But when somebody asks you a question about the Bible, you say, whoa. I don't know. And the Bible is what really is going to transform our life. Any other book is for entertainment. So what I wanted to share with you today is how do we make that happen? How can we take the Bible and make the Bible something that we work with in our life, not just to be a fan of knowing the Bible, but because we can be a radical follower of Jesus Christ if we know what the Bible says. And how do we take the Bible and look and learn and grow from it? First, you, we have to be receptive to it. We have to be receptive to it. And we're going to take James chapter 1. James chapter 1, and we're going to talk a little bit about how we're going to do this and, and what does the Bible say and how can we take the Bible, instead of just being something that you bring to church or something that you open up on your iPad or something that you have tangibly that we just read maybe early in the morning or maybe we read a couple verses at night or maybe we take when we're going to the, to the church service. Or it is something that needs to be, as a child of God, something that's going to radically transform your life. You will never be a radical follower of Christ until you first learn what Jesus Christ has done for you and what he wants to do through you. That's very important. So let's look at James chapter 1. Let's start at verses 19 through 21. It says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which was able to save your souls. Receive with meekness the the implanted word that was willing and able to save your souls. The word of God is the tool in which the Holy Spirit uses to give to you wisdom and insight to understand what Christ wants for your life and how God wants to work within your life. So how do we do that? How do we receive it? Let me give you a few ideas. The first is the capacity to listen. The capacity to listen. We need to learn Scripture. And how we learn scripture, the Bible says swift or quick to hear. When somebody is sharing scripture, when sh somebody is sharing what God is doing, the way that we are going to learn the scripture is to open up the word of God and learn about applications from scripture. What does the Bible say we should do and how we can do it? Quick means I, I have an intensity, a quick to listen. 
with a humble spirit, I have a desire to open up some scripture and find something new. Read it into a point that I'm, I'm excited about what God can teach me through the scripture. I have to have a capacity to listen. And then a controlled tongue. Slow to speak. Slow to speak. Sometimes, I don't know if you've realized, but sometimes we do not necessarily agree with everything that the Bible says. And sometimes when we disagree with what the Bible says, we share our opinion about what we think the Bible should say or what we want it to say. And the Bible, James is saying, whoa, 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 calm down. Let's not, it's not about your opinion. It's, let's listen to what the Bible has to say. And the Bible is the absolute authority, the absolute truth. And if the Bible says, thus saith the Lord, really, if we can be honest, we don't really have a say in the matter because the Bible is God's word. So what we must do is not necessarily disagree with it and fight against it. What we must do is say, let's, okay, let's, let's keep my mouth shut and let's learn from the word of God. Control our tongue. Slow to speak. One thing that we, are, we need to learn and we need to hear and we need to apply. And then it needs to say we have to have a calm demeanor. A calm demeanor. Um, slow to anger. What does that mean to the church? That means just because you know what the Word of God says doesn't mean everybody else is applying the Word of God. And if somebody else does something that the Bible doesn't say that they should do, we can't get mad at what they do. What we must do is pray for them and know this is what God truly wants. But slow to anger is just because you know something and they don't know it doesn't mean that we should get mad at them because our demeanor towards them is the ability that we have to share our faith with them. So let's not get upset, but let's show others if we know what the Word of God states. And let's not get angry. Let's not get all mad. Let's be slow to anger. James is not telling us that we should never get angry at sin, but James is saying let's not get angry at the sinner and let's focus on what the Word of God says, that the Word of God can transform our life. And then it says a clean life, a clean life. In order to take the Word of God, James is communicating us. He said, then you have to get away from something. He says, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. What happens with sin, sin disrupts our ability to understand God's holiness. When we have sin within our life and we read the word or we hear the word, we start looking at the word of God through our lens, through our issues. We start thinking God would never love us. We start thinking that I've done too much or I've gone too far. We're starting thinking that we're filthy, that God would never love us and God will not work with us. And what the Bible is saying here in James saying, hey, listen guys, Start cleaning up your life. Use the word of God to see what you need to do, how you need to live. God has not given us the word of God to be a killjoy. God is using the word of God to give us freedom and righteousness within his life. Don't be caught up in the overflow of wickedness. So to be receptive, he gives us four things. And then it says, we must be submissive. You must be submissive to God's word. So if we know what the word of God, we receive it. We see how we should receive it. And then how do we become submissive to it? To be submissive means I don't have to be in charge. I don't have to know everything. I don't have to have all the answers. What I have to be is I have to say, you know what, I've got some stuff going on in my life. And I know that the word of God is there to give us some abilities to understand what truth is. It may not be an entertaining book that I sit down and I can't get my hands off of and I want to read five books of, before I get done with it and know everything about it because that's entertainment. But sometimes the Word of God gets into our face. And sometimes when the Word of God gets into our face and calls us out about a sin that we are in, sometimes it's easier us to slam the book and put it down and to walk away from it, right? Because God's going to call us out. And God uses the Holy Spirit to understand what we are, what we are doing, and what we need to do. And the Word of God is a light into our soul. And if we read the Word of God and we become convicted on certain issues, we have to make a decision submissively. Am I going to accept the truth of the Word of God 
or am I going to slam the book down and walk away and hope when I go to church the next couple weeks, somebody's not going to preach about the topic that I'm working on. Sometimes we need to be submissively opening the word of God. Let's look at verses 22 through 25. It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving yourselves, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not forgetful, hearer but doer of the work, this is one will be blessed in he that does. When you hear the word, when you understand what the word is saying, you come to church service, or you go to youth camp, or you go to revival service, and you hear what God is saying through you, and, and God convicts your heart, and you say, you know what, I should try that. You know what, I probably ought to cry, try to give that up. Or maybe I'm convicted that I'm going to start reading, or I'm going to start praying. There's something about what somebody is communicating to you about through the word of God, and you're convicted to the core. But, Time goes on. You know the feeling, but the fervor of that moment is swept by because of time. And then you forget. You don't care. So you pass by. It's like looking into a mirror and seeing the truth, but not liking the truth, so we black out the mirrors. And it's easier not to know the truth than it is to understand what God truly wants for our life. Where I believe the word of God is like a mirror that's completely open. And when you look in that mirror, you know exactly who you are, you know exactly what he wants, and you know the truth. And the, the mirror of our life is the word of God. So, what does it do for us? Number one, to be submissive to the word of God, it requires an examination. It requires an examination. I went, um, I was out, a couple weeks ago, doing some stupid things, and I broke my thumb. I had a little, I can't, I'm going to gross you out. When you, everybody see my thumb? Right there is when my bone pops. Right in the knuckle of my bone. And you know what? That bone, I could set that bone like this, and it doesn't hurt. But on purpose, when I do that, it hurts. And the doctor gave me an examination, and he put my hand down, on the x-ray and you know what that guy did he popped my knuckle i mean i said it was okay but you know he just had to see and he just popped my knuckle you know i was like turned white it hurt he had to give me a thorough examination it could look like it's broken but until he gave it a thorough examination until he gave me the x-ray until he hurt my thumb he would never tell me what the problem was with my thumb and you know what the Bible does? In a thorough examination, it's going to get you where you hurt. Our weaknesses, with the lens of God's word, will expose where you're hurting. Now, you may not know what you're hurting with. You may just experience some pain, or you may experience some things. But the examination of God when he takes your life, your spiritual life, and he puts it under the, the microscope of spirituality and the word of God, it allows us to see what the truth really is. It requires an examination. The Bible says, looking into the perfect law of liberty. The perfect law. Understanding what the Bible says and understand that we must be perfect, but understand we cannot because God died for us through his son Jesus Christ. He understands that we must first acknowledge that we need help. And then it requires reflection. It requires reflection. The Bible says in Psalms 119:11, I have hidden in your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. If you do not know it's sin, you will not know what to do. But the word of God is open into our lives and the Holy Spirit will convict our lives. And if we know it is sin, we should stay away from it. But in Psalms chapter 119, 11, I have hidden in your hearts in your heart that you might not sin. God gives to us the ability to understand what the truth is. It requires reflection. Not only an examination, 
but a reflection to honestly look into our life to understand what do I want to do. See, uh, there's there's a uh, a book by um, that's not the right one by Tozer that says this. A. W. Tozer put it this way. The book is called uh, "The Root of Righteousness." There is an evil which is an effect on the Christian realm. May be more destructive than communism, Romanism, or liberalism combined. It is the glaring disparity between theology and practicing among profession Christians. So wide is the gulf between theory and practice in the church that an inquiring stranger who chances upon both would scarcely dream that there was a relation between the two of them. An intelligent observer of our human scene would hear on Sunday morning's message and later watch the Sunday afternoon conduct of those two who heard it and would conclude that there had been an examination of two distinct and contrary religions. It appears to me that too many Christians want to enjoy the thrill of being right, but what are willing to endure the convenience of being right. They want to hear it, they want to experience it, but it is a contrast between hearing the word and doing the word. And the Bible says in James that so often we are hearers, but we are not doers. And Tozer said it's very, it's a, it's a compelling evidence that many people in the world today, they come to church and they learn and they hear the word of God, but they walk out the door and they do their own thing. And it's compelling to them that there must be a change so that requires a response. We must do what God wants us to do. A compelling response. When we do what God wants us to do, we look into a mirror and we see the truth and we say something like this. I have to do it. I have to take the word of God. And God is trying to look at each one of us on an individual basis and apply the scripture into our life. And he says this. He says this many times. I want you to be holy. I want you to look in the areas of your life that I am going to exam, that I am going to have you look back, and I will need you to start working in those areas within your life. Now, God doesn't give us the magic pill, and he says, here, you take this pill three times a day, and within a week that you're going to be healed. Yeah, our spirituality doesn't work like that because the flesh is very mighty within our life. And it's an everyday process that God says through the word of God, I need you to examine the word to know what is truth. But the Bible says we have to die daily to ourselves and take up his cross and follow him. So when the word of God says we must examine, it's not going to be an easy way out. But it is what has to be done in order for God to work within our life. But the third thing, you must be moved by God's word. We must be moved by God's word. There has to be an overwhelming compulsion within your life to be moved by the power of God. Not just an excitement in a church service. It's not just like we're reading a book until the trilogy is over with and then we can't wait till the next book is out. God has given us a complete mandate through the word of God and we have to be moved by the word of God. You know, there's stories in the Bible that are absolutely phenomenal that are in the Old Testament that you could read those stories and you, can, you could try to un understand those concepts in the Old Testament. And every time you read that book and every time you read that story, there's something fresh and alive that pops off that page and gets into your mind because the Holy Spirit is saying, I want to give you a fresh perspective. I want to give you something new. I want to give you something that you're going through right now. See, every sermon that you hear, every message that is communicated to you, it can be the same message, but here's the difference. And the, here's, here's the most compelling thing about preaching, is I may say one thing. I may try to communicate a point, but here's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit takes the words that I am saying out of my mouth about a point, and your life you have issues going on that I don't even know about. You have things that God is working with in your life. And what God does, he takes the words out of my mouth that I'm speaking about a topic, and he takes them from my mouth into issues that you're going through, and he applies the Holy Spirit to your heart, and you're saying, Wow! How did you know that? I needed that today. That's exactly what I'm going through. I, did my wife call you before church? Why? 
is because the Holy Spirit loves you and is taking the Word of God and He's saying, I want to give to you what you need. The Word of God is alive, it's sharp, and it's oil to our need. And what it does, it applies to our heart and it changes our heart and changes our life. I don't know what you're going through, but you know what the Holy Spirit does? And when the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and applies it to your life, He is going to make it fit to what your need is. The Bible says, His Word will never come back to me void. In other words, he, He's smarter than I am. He understands things that I don't even comprehend. And He knows your need within your life. So when you say, I have a problem, and the Word of God is spoken, the Holy Spirit does the work. The Holy Spirit is what works within people's lives to fix things. So, how, does it be, how can we be moved to God? First, we need to guard our tongue. We need to guard our tongue. Um, sometimes when we as Christians, we do not understand what God wants, sometimes we just have to guard our tongue. The Bible says in verses 26 through 27, it says, If anyone among you think he is religious... And does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart. The man's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. To visit the orphans and the widows to their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from this world. Anyone who thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. The biggest thing that we must do is we have to guard our tongue. We don't have to debate every point of the Word of God. God wants us to be able to be defensive. He wants us to be apologetic, be able to defend the faith. But we do not have to argue every unbeliever that we come in contact to about what the Word of God says. The Bible is on its own merit. We must stand up and say what the truth is in a loving, kind, forgiving, graceful manner. Guard our tongue. And then the Bible says we need to give to others. Give to others. The greatest thing that we can do is let other people into our life. Now, whether it's monetarily or whether it's physically, we need to see what people need and help meet those needs. Now, a lot of us don't have a lot of resources. And I don't believe that we should have to sell everything that we have to give to somebody else. But what we can do spiritually is this, if there is a need and we can meet that need, we should do everything within our power to meet someone's need. It's Christmas season coming right around the corner. And we've already had needs being met. It's all over Facebook. Somebody saying, I need something or I want this or I need to have this for my class or we have a family that's in need. You know, all it takes is a word. And those that have a giving spirit is very easily they meet that need because they have that spirit within their life. And all I'm saying as Christians, if we are going to take the word and let the word of God apply to our life, it has to be fruitful, not just in our minds, but we can't just be doers of the word. We can't be hearers of the word. We have to be doers of the word also. There has to be action to what we do. And then the last thing that we have to do is we have to guard our hearts. We have to guard our hearts. Now, this is, we could talk about the examination and we could talk about the reflection, but when we're talking about the Word of God, why do we have to guard our hearts? Because the heart is desperately wicked. And sometimes we start thinking that we deserve something or that God will make a special a way that I can have whatever I want, whether it's what the Word of God says or not, that I'll make a special deal with God. That God will understand. That God will forgive me and it'll be okay. And sometimes we think God so much loves us that He'll let us do whatever we want and God will forgive us. And the Bible says, should we continue in sin, that sin may abound? And God says, no. You can't continue in sin. Because in that sin causes destruction. And it causes my word to come back void because of the sin within your life. 
So what we must do is we must guard our hearts. We must say, God, I need you to help me. I need you to love me. I need you to understand the word of God that you have given to me. And I want God to work in a supernatural way that God works in the heart of his life, in the heart of your life, that when you open up the word of God, it will absolutely transform everything that you do. Transform my life, transform my heart. How do I guard it? I have to give it to God. You're saying, I don't read the word. I don't understand the word. I've been in church for 30 years, and I know the main points, but I don't know the transforming power of the word of God. You have to make a decision, as I do. The word of God has to be something that I'm not just a fan about. I have to be radically committed that the word of God, God's word to you and to me, is something more important than just words on a page. It's something that liberates my life. And once I know what the Bible says, once I know what God wants within my life, once I know thus saith the Lord, I can't just say, I know what the Bible says. You know what he's asking you to do? Don't just be hearers of the word. Be doers of the word. That's the hard part. That means it calls to action. That if I guard my heart and I get my pride out of the way and I hear the word, and the Bible saying, thus saith the Lord. In other words, this is what you should do. You have to give up your flesh. Give up your will. And say, I want to do what God wants me to do. And then, our spirituality will not be in vain. It will be one that can be blessed by God. See, to be, to be a follower of Christ. To be a radical follower of Christ. To be an enthusiastic admirer of what Jesus Christ has done for you and for me. Here's what it is not. It is not just observing what Jesus Christ did for you. It's not just saying, I get to go to heaven when I die. That is a fan because you enjoy what he has done for you. But to be an enthusiastic follower of Christ, it is he has given to you a word the Bible. And if you are going to be an enthusiastic follower of Christ, read it. Take it. Apply it. And do it. We cannot be committed to Christ if we do not know Christ. You can't take everything that I know for your knowledge. It's kind of like the old Rocky show. Rocky and Apollo Creed they were getting ready on, I think it was, it was Rocky III. They were getting ready to fight again. And they were in the gymnasium and they were by themselves. And Apollo Creed was getting ready to fight. And, and Rocky says, hey, you can't beat me, you know. He said, you taught me everything I know. And Apollo Creed said this, but I didn't teach you everything I know. And that is so important. Just because we think we know something, God knows so much more. And he wants to do something with you that you can't comprehend but take the Bible, open it. I challenge you this week, is wherever your Bible is, whether it's on your phone, your iPad, or a book, take the Bible and read. Say, Lord, I need you to give to me something that I've never experienced before. I want you to show me something radically new and fresh. Because I promise you, if you ask God to give to you the very desires of your heart spiritually and you open up the word of God and the Holy Spirit starts working within your life, the word of God, the Bible, the only book that is alive and transforming will do something for you. And it won't do what the Hunger Games or Fifty Shades of Grey or Twilight series can do for you. It will do something much greater. It will do something deep within your soul and it'll give you a contentment and a satisfaction and forgiveness that nothing else can give you. Not a book, not a movie, or not a sports team. It will give you that inner peace knowing that God's word was written for me. And if I just accept it, I can have a transformed life. And if I have a transformed life, what I'm going to be 
is I'm going to be a committed, radical, enthusiastic follower of Christ. That's our goal. That's what our desire is as a church. The Word of God is the most important tool that God has given to us today. Let's take it and use it to our benefit because He wants to use it through us. Do not be a hearer of the Word, but be a doer. Put into practice what you know. Don't hide it. Don't look into a mirror and forget what it is. Don't look in a mirror and forget who you are. Be honest on your examination and let God work with who you are. Not what you think you are. Not what other people think you are. But got God face to face in a mirror. Do an examination and then take the word of God to heal, to fix, and to anoint you into the next phase of your life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you for your love to us. And Lord, we ask you to guide in our hearts and our lives that everything that we say and everything that we do through the Word of God will be something that can, that can change us and to make us. Lord, the commitment that we have today is just that we want to be closer to you. We want you to work within our lives. So today, on a daily basis, inspire us. And motivate us to open up the word of God. To change us by seeing things fresh and new. Many of us have read through the word. But Lord, allow us to focus on what you want for us today. And transform us and help us. Encourage us to do that examination. And Lord, we ask you to help us through this process. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor Alf.